Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. Like the other disciples in Mark chapter 10, everyone who hears the gospel is quick to assume they understand why James and John were wrong to request positions of honor next to Jesus. Is it simply that this request is presumptuous, or is something else going on? Why does Jesus insist that such an honor can only be bestowed? Were the other disciples right to upbraid James and John? What is the real sin? being addressed in the story, and why does everyone miss the point? In the Gospel of Mark, missing the point is the point, and ignorance is not bliss. You're listening to the Bible as Literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 63 of the Bible as Literature podcast. So, Father, last Sunday you were talking about the reading from the Gospel where the disciples want to sit at the right hand and they're trying to sort out who's supposed to sit where in the kingdom. And then the other disciples get jealous because they're discussing who should sit at the right hand. And so you were talking about this in your sermon. I thought you made some very interesting points and some very helpful points on how to understand this and what this says about the assembly. Can you explain a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I've said many times, in fact, I wrote about this in my commentary on Galatians, that scripture works like a mirror. It presents you with a myriad of characters who are all flawed, and many of them are flawed in very gross and exaggerated ways, which makes the way that people read scripture all the more perplexing because they take these characters that are just distorted in their examples of betrayal and corruption and they lift them up as examples and heroes right which is a whole another problem but it relates to this gospel because when we look at those characters and either judge them or worship them either way we condemn ourselves because when we judge them we judge ourselves because we're guilty of worse And when we worship them, we condemn ourselves because we then become guilty of idolatry. Plus, it seems like we're holding up these people while ignoring their faults. And then we tend to become accustomed to ignoring those particular faults. So then we ignore those faults in ourselves as well. Exactly. I mean, this is the beauty of literature. It exposes its addressees. It exposes those who come into contact with the narrative. And, I mean, you have this pattern repeatedly in the portrayal of the Pharisees, who are metaphoric characters who represent the Christian community. They represent the leaders of the church in the New Testament. The New Testament is not addressed to the Jewish community. The New Testament is addressed to the early church. It is a judgment against the early church, which means that when its characters are under condemnation, it's the church that is under condemnation. Right. I think that a lot of times we misunderstand the Pharisees because we highlight the fact that they're Jews and they're not Jesus's people, while we downplay the fact that they should know better and they're more interested in tricking Jesus or getting out of things, worried more about themselves and how they look in front of other people rather than the things that are most important. And these become the salient features of the Pharisees. Exactly. And the classic Christian sin today is the proclamation that we're not like the Pharisees or we don't want to be Pharisaic in our ministry because clearly the Pharisees are the bad guys and we want to be the good guys. Well, with all due respect, the New Testament was written by a school of Pharisees. And that should tell you something about why they chose the metaphor of the Pharisee as the evil character. I mean, it's literature. People have to, you know, wake up and smell the coffee as the expression goes. I think that to say we don't want to be like the Pharisees, we don't want to have a Pharisaic ministry, I think you have to begin with the fact we are Pharisees. Exactly. And we don't want to be Pharisaical. So where do we go from here? I think that's the thing is recognizing the bad features of people in 
scripture in this literature and understanding that those very qualities apply to us. You know, we all think that we are Mary sitting at Jesus's feet when in fact the story is trying to condemn us for being Martha and running around trying to do all this stuff and not paying attention to the teaching. And we're judging Martha, which makes us Pharisaic. We condemn the Pharisees when Jesus comes into confrontation with them. And it's a trap. Scripture is entrapping the addressee because as a human being, whose default setting is to project your ego into literature, you can't help but try to identify with the one whom you consider the protagonist. Scripture undoes this idea of Jesus as protagonist when he's killed at the end of the story. So at every turn, it's undermining your expectations. But once you hear the story of how poorly the Pharisee behaved, and then you condemn the Pharisee, you become the Pharisee, and then the parable, the mashal that you're hearing, then becomes a judgment against you. And this gospel on Sunday was particularly powerful in this regard. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking on ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were fearful. And again, he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him. And remember, we talked in previous episodes, this is multiple times he's trying to explain to the disciples what's going to happen to him. When a father or a teacher keeps repeating himself, it's because he knows you don't understand. Exactly. And you just have to think of an example where an authority figure in your life was critiquing you, and it's painful to hear the critique. It's painful to hear what he or she is saying. And then you say, oh, no, 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 I understand, I understand. The teacher at that moment knows that you're saying I understand and trying to say the right thing because you don't want to deal with what the teacher is saying. So that's the dynamic here. Jesus is repeating himself. It's not good news. Now, Scripture repeats itself, as we've said many times, which is not good news. It's good news in the sense that it's hopeful that the teacher isn't giving up on you, but it's bad news because it means you still don't get it. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him, and three days later he will rise again. So now it's finally laid out. Throughout these couple of chapters, chapters 9 and 10, even back to 8, he's been trying to tell them, look, I'm going to die. Look, the Son of Man's supposed to die. Look, if you know Scripture, you know he's going to die. And now it's like all the details are laid out here, finally. And so then we come to verse 36, and the teacher's been lecturing and lecturing and lecturing on point A, and then somebody in the classroom raises their hand, and they want to go off on a tangent. And that tangent that they're going to raise in their question demonstrates once again that they were not listening to the lecture. I mean, this is beautiful because in verse 35, James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? That's the key right there, that... They don't know what they're asking. We talked last week about how there is no such thing as the messianic secret, but there is such a thing as a teacher who doesn't trust his disciples because they don't know what the heck they're talking about. Well, I mean, this is like a teacher who teaches a class, gives the exam, and everyone gets an F. And then he gives a second chance. They can take the same test again, and then they get an F. And then he gives the same test a third time, and they get an F. And then you get two students who raise their hands and say, which of us is the best student teacher? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Now, what's interesting, though, is he's not. And this is where the assembly always stumbles, especially in an American context, because in our desire as Americans not to be Pharisaic, we are perhaps the culture that is perfected in our own way, Pharisaism. Everyone hears this and they do the same thing that the other disciples will do shortly in this passage. They say to themselves, oh, They're so arrogant. How dare they? That is not the sin in this passage. Jesus is telling them, the one to whom the position of honor is assigned is up to God. It is my father who decides everything is from his right hand. And that's the point about sin and sinful characters in the Bible. All of the characters whom God anoints with the special responsibility to carry forward his teaching are corrupt but he decides. So right away when Jesus says that, if you're familiar with scripture, you know that means that they're not ruled out. He's just teaching them. That's number one. Number two, he explains your problem 
is not that you want to sit in a position of honor per se. Your problem is that you do not understand what the position of honor is. You have it backwards. I've been telling you I'm going to be crucified. And you still think that when you sit at my right hand, it's worldly honor. This is what I don't want you to preach. So my point is that everyone rushes to judge them for being cocky, but that's not the issue. Cockiness is non-functional with respect to duty. This is what you can only understand if you're from the old world, the world of apprenticeship, the world of kingship, the world of station, the world of authority. I mean, we still have all those things in our modern Western culture, except everyone now is a king, as opposed to living in a community of people who have to deal with power structures. Everyone now exercises power. So everyone is entitled and they don't understand what's happening here. Jesus is saying, look, it's my dad's decision. You're not worthy is the subtext, but guess what? You are going to be assigned this position, but you don't understand what it means. But you will understand because you are going to suffer the same things I'm going to suffer. You're going to drink from the same cup and you're going to end in the same way that I end with persecution and martyrdom. But the problem is you don't understand. And here's the big issue. If you don't understand, then even if you're crucified, it will not be unto life. It's not martyrdom just because you suffer. You have to suffer specifically for the teaching. I mean, he's upset because they're going to drink of the same cup and it might be fruitless because they still don't get it. This basic idea that they don't understand what honor is, yet they want the position of honor, is precisely the reason why Jesus is having such a hard time getting through to them. They want honor to be the same honor that Caesar gets. And Jesus says, by the way, the Son of Man has to suffer. Well, that makes no sense. No, it does make sense as long as you're willing to toss in the trash your idea of what honor is. Honor is whatever God gives, and whoever has honor bestowed on them is the honored one. Even if you have suffered, even if you've been mistreated, when God decides to bestow honor on you, you're the honored one. And this is what they don't understand about Jesus. They want Jesus to be honored by human beings. They want Jesus to be honored by the system. And whether he's honored by God or not, they assume this comes through the system, which is precisely the problem. God works outside the system. God is above the king. God is outside of the king. The king is an anomaly that God never wanted in the first place. This is why the title of James, the brother of the Lord, is pejorative. You have to read scripture as scripture. You cannot read it the way that the disciples in this pericope are hearing Jesus. Because there is no honor in being closely related to Jesus. There is no honor in saying that you are tied somehow to Jesus through some connection or lineage or tradition. Because the only way you are tied to Jesus is by being dishonored. So the subtext here with James in particular, and it comes up obviously in a pronounced way in Paul's letters, especially Galatians. The subtext here is that James is a nepotist. We know this. So there's that whole broader context in the New Testament. But again, if you stick specifically to this mashal, when the addressees of this text gang up on James for saying they want to sit at the right hand of Jesus when he comes in glory, they are put under greater condemnation than James, and they are put under even greater condemnation than the other disciples. Because on what basis are you condemning James and John? On the basis of your own lack of understanding. So you show yourself a Pharisee, and you show yourself as ignorant as the characters in the story, but the condemnation against you is greater because you have the story and you still don't get it. Hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John. Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. So he's saying, okay, you understand what honor means. But this is the honor among the Gentiles. This is the honor among the world. But it is not this way among you, Jesus says. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So this isn't Jesus just pronouncing something profound and mysterious. What Jesus is doing 
is very specifically challenging their notion of what honor and glory are. He purposely does this. In Jesus Christ Superstar, Jesus sings a whole song. You do not understand what honor is. You do not understand what glory is. I love the fact that this question is central in that musical. But here, I think it's where it's coming from because he says, this is what honor looks like in your eyes. But I'm trying to tell you this is what honor actually is. And I'm going to demonstrate it. This is why when we talk about the so-called messianic secret, they're not going to understand until the resurrection has happened and they've received the message from the angel. Because at the end of Mark, the disciples who have not seen the resurrection hear of the resurrection from the man who tells them this is what happened and shoots them back towards Galilee so they can then re- do the whole process of the gospel, Which gospel leaves of Mark. you with what Jesus has been saying all throughout, that the Son of Man has to suffer many things, be crucified, and will be raised. And that's what they find at the tomb. It's very powerful. So again, it's just repeating this message over and over again, because even when you talk about them not understanding until after the resurrection, people will then say, oh, yes, because then there's proof. No, there's no proof. All you find at the tomb is the same word that you were honored with when Jesus walked among you. And when Jesus calls them all together to explain to them that they are not to behave as Gentiles behave, that their system of honor and shame has to be different than the Gentilic system of honor and shame, he is not just addressing James and John. He is addressing all of them. Because when the assembly, the other disciples, when they gang up and start criticizing James and John, They are exercising authority the same way the Gentiles do. Because in a Roman context, as we've said many times, how do you lift yourself up? By condemning others. It's so difficult. People want to be able to say there is good and there is evil. But that is why Adam and Eve transgressed and were kicked out of the garden. I was just watching this television show on Netflix about this character, Frank Underwood, politician. He manipulates people, manipulates situations to gain advantage in Washington. It's classic Roman politics. It's Byzantine politics. It's nothing new. But there was this scene where he needed to manipulate a couple so that he could avoid political scandal. So he humbled himself before this couple and spoke to them in a way that opened their hearts and helped him avert scandal. And then he stepped away from the scene and assumed his role as the narrator. And he explained to the audience that his people were a noble people and that humility was their strength and their vice. And he said, if you humble yourself before them, you can get them to do anything. And I think the writers tapped on something very powerful with that observation. Because human beings are fooled by humility. Because we deal with virtues Hellenistically. We say it is good to be humble. It is bad to be arrogant. It is good to be this way. It is bad to be that way. And then we build a framework of spirituality. That's what we call it in the churches. Spirituality around these concepts of good and evil. Again, we're back in the garden. We still want to partake of the tree so we can say what's good and what's evil. But in that moment... Humility functioned as a tool of destruction and of deceit. Now, when the disciples or those gathered around the gospel reading condemn James and John for their lack of humility, they are succumbing to the system of lies that I'm talking about. It's complete arrogance that then they would upbraid them. This is what Phariseeism is. It's self-righteousness. Exactly. Self-righteousness can paint itself any color, It can wear any clothes. It can have any tone of voice. It can cloak itself in any deed. And the only way the disciples in the Gospel of Mark or the addressees of the Gospel of Mark will ever be able to discern what self-righteousness is in themselves first and foremost and in the world around them is by not trusting what they see. By understanding the gospel. By understanding the gospel and then trusting what they hear from God, which will open their eyes to all things so that they cannot be fooled by a snake oil salesman who's trying to avert scandal on the backs of their embrace of false humility. It's very important to emphasize this because this plays out at the end of Mark. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, 
Don't be amazed. He's such a good man, Father Mark. He was so humble. Well, if you believe he was a good man and you're so enamored by his humility, then you are not a son or a daughter of the living God. Jesus. You are a worshiper of Caesar or whomever. And the sin in being amazed is that Jesus said he was going to suffer. And they said, no, 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 you can't suffer. Well, no, he did suffer. Well, he's going to be raised again on the third day. Well, I don't even understand what that means. Oh my goodness, you're telling me he rose from the dead? Yes, because that's what he was telling you all along. Why are you amazed? You're amazed that Jesus was right? Why would you be amazed that Jesus is right? You're amazed at the phenomenon of the resurrection, which is not what you are supposed to be impressed with. Exactly. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told right. so you. Why, anyways, why would you be surprised if you already have the text? You already have the text. He already told you this. It's there. And Jesus isn't even referring to himself. He says, in scripture, you know that the son of man has to suffer. Jesus is telling them what scripture has already been trying to tell them that they don't get. When Jesus tries to reiterate it to them, they don't understand. And then when it actually comes to pass, ooh, ah, look, it happened. Well, of course it happened. Look, it's like when a wise parent, which there are fewer and fewer of in our culture, but when there is a wise parent and they tell their child, you don't understand now, you will understand after I'm gone. When the parent says that and when the parent is correct and their words do come to pass, nothing has changed their statement is their statement. The reality of the statement is the reality of the statement. Its truth is its truth. It's just that the disciple was not ready or in a situation to be made ready to hear what was being said. But it's not as though the event changes anything. The event of time passing or the parent passing or whatever, that's not what changes anything. It's just suddenly the child over time can now actually understand what was true all along. This is the point. You had the gospel all along. Jesus was telling you all along. What did you expect to change when you ran to the tomb? It's the same message. That's the key. And that's why it's so important in the gospels that you're never allowed to see the resurrection. You only hear the resurrection. And you hear it from people who in the story heard of the resurrection from the angel because the teaching should be enough for you. It should be enough. I gave them Moses and the prophets. Even if I should raise someone from the dead, they wouldn't listen if they didn't listen to Moses and the prophets. It's right there in front of you. And at the end of Mark, they're afraid. They won't say anything. When did we hear of them being afraid and not saying anything? Is when Jesus was trying to explain his own suffering. And they're afraid and they stopped asking questions because exactly. they didn't understand anymore. Exactly. So I think it's really important that we retrain our ears we have to divest ourselves of notions of humility and arrogance and good and evil, our notions of strength and weakness. The word virtue is anti-scriptural because scripture is all about crucifixion and weakness. And virtue means strength. It's God who bestows virtue. God bestows righteousness. But the virtue he bestows is an anti-virtue because it's weakness. Because as you know, Father Paul Tarazi points out in his commentary on Galatians. This is something that I key in on in my own writing. In all of the catalogs of the virtues in Hellenistic philosophy, love is always omitted. There's no reference to love in those catalogs. Humility, fortitude, kindness, forbearance, patience. I mean, it reads like an inscription over Caesar's chair on the Roman seal. But where is love on the Roman seal? And why is love connected to this idea of crucifixion? Because you cannot love without first putting yourself underneath others. But you do so when you are wielding the gospel from a position of strength, not false humility, false weakness. It has to be from a position of strength because you are not standing on your own merits. You are standing on the merits of God the Father who handed this teaching down to be preached. This is why Jesus is saying, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. The one who appears arrogant is the one who says, I don't need you. But the reason why Jesus says, I don't need you is because he doesn't need you to serve him. 
He doesn't need you to do stuff for him. He's not going to pat you on the back and say, good job, when you bring him a glass of water. He doesn't need your glass of water. He can get water out of a rock. He doesn't need your glass of water. He doesn't need you. And he's not saying it to be mean. He's saying it that you do this in order to serve, not to get from others. That's the selfish part of it. And Jesus is not there for that. Jesus is not showing his power by how many people serve him to say an entire kingdom bows down to him is counter gospel. It's important not to turn the gospel into a cheap morality play. It is not a cheap morality play. You cannot walk away from the story and say, oh, it's wrong to want to sit at the right hand. No, it's wrong to be ignorant of scripture. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for having me. Just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.